Welcome to the Beyond Barriers podcast. If you're an ambitious woman who wants to dominate your career, then you are in the right place. This podcast is co-hosted by Nikki Barua, digital innovator, serial entrepreneur, author, and speaker. And Monica Marquez, ex-Googler, diversity expert, and senior corporate leader. From inspiring stories to cutting-edge strategies, you'll learn how to develop the skill set, mindset, and tool set to get future ready fast and accelerate your success. Hi, I'm Monica Marquez, your host for today's episode. Visibility matters. How can we expect to change the world if we're invisible? That's what we will discuss in this episode featuring Suzette Yasmin Robotham, who is a passionate advocate for visibility and authenticity as a catalyst for change. Suzette is a diversity, equity, inclusion practitioner, speaker, connector, coach, and a leading black woman in tech. She currently leads the diversity programs on the global product and software engineering recruiting team at Facebook. Suzette has more than a decade of leadership experience with expertise in talent acquisition, diversity and inclusion, leadership development, strategic planning, and relationship building across various industry sectors. Over her career, she has contributed her work to large urban school districts such as Atlanta Public Schools and Metro Nashville Public Schools, as well as an education reform organizations that include Teach for America, the New Teacher Project, and the Achievement Network. She previously served as the Lead Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Program Manager on the Google Search and Assistant Team. Suzette also founded a platform created to amplify the voices of Black women in tech and beyond called hashtag Black Tech Beauty in 2020. Suzette has been tapped as a speaker by a number of organizations across the U.S. and Canada for her thought leadership and authenticity in the workplace and diversity and inclusion, and she has been featured in the TEDx speaker, TEDx Beacon Street 2015. Suzette is, a pa- is passionate about the power that can be realized in spaces where vulnerability, empathy, and authenticity are encouraged, and she's devoted to using her talents to connect others whether individuals or organizations, to the people, opportunities, and resources that will help them realize, access, and achieve their highest potential. Suzette is also a TNJ 40 Under 40 2019 honoree. Her words to live by, you were brave before you were born. And that was from her mommy. Visit imbeyondbarriers.com where you'll find show notes and links to all the resources in this episode, including the best way to get in touch with Suzette. Welcome, Suzette. Thank you so much for joining us on the Beyond Barriers podcast. We are so excited to have you here to share your story and to just inspire our listeners and, you know, for you to share um, some of your experiences and the way that you are pioneering and kind of creating platforms to elevate women of color. So without further ado, let's dive right in and share a little bit about yourself, your journey, and maybe, you know, a couple of things uh, in your journey that you've learned, lessons learned that you would love to share with our listeners. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, Monica. It's one, amazing to be reconnected um, with another phenomenal woman of color in, uh, in the tech world, in the tech space, um, and super mm-hmm. proud of the platform that you've created. So thank you for sharing mm-hmm. uh, space with me. Uh, I think it's interesting because <clears throat> uh, I don't know about you, but I feel like 2020 has really been <laughs> the most reflective year um, of my adult life. And yes. I did <laughs> in a deep um, space of reflection. Um, my father actually um, transitioned um, into being an ancestor in December. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I just came into 2020, like really, really, really thinking about like who I am as a, a woman, who I am as a cisgender, heterosexual black woman, who I am as a black woman that's working in um, a space that can also oftentimes feel like a monolith, mm-hmm. actually like moved to actually feeling like I um, was actually just having an impact, right? Mm-hmm. And so, like, if I even back out of that, um, you know, I had no idea that I would be in tech. So if you, (laughs) like, I, like, was at the University of Florida my freshman year and was like, you know what, like, I someday will wake up and work for, like, the number one tech company in the world, right? Uh 
I don't think, one, as like a first generation American, first generation college graduate, I'm the first person in my generation of um, grandchildren to actually have gone to college and have to completed two degrees. Mm-hmm. And on my grandmother's side, that's out of 21 grandkids, right? So mm. it, there are things that I probably didn't envision for myself just because I didn't see them. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would say like the thing that undergirds my journey absolutely is, you know, everything happens for a reason. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, um, everything from not becoming pre-med. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> Get out um, my freshman year of college, right? So like chemistry, like literally kicked me out of being pre-med um, to moving to Atlanta. Um, I went to Georgia State University for my graduate degree immediately following undergrad because I was like, okay, I want to become a policy wonk, right? Mm-hmm. So um, my master's is in urban policy studies um, with a specialization in social policy. Mm -hmm. And what better place to learn about um, just issues that impact um, communities of color, especially like the black community, the being in the epicenter of blackness at the time, right? So all of our classes were really focused on how policy impacted the broader kind of Atlanta community. So this is around the time that the Beltline was being built. And so it was just like a great time to be in policy. Mm -hmm. Um, and ended up working in Atlanta Public Schools in the office of the chief of staff Mm -hmm. um, and met my mentor. And the thing that, and my story will always be inclusive of Dr. Janice Mongruden because she was the first um, manager I had that was like, hey, like, I am deeply committed to you. I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to grow you. Mm -hmm. Um, And more important than that, I see you. Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) Janice like saw deep into the core of who I was as a person Mm -hmm. um, and just nurtured that. And um, the the things that she said to me when I first started working for her, because I actually started as um, a research assistant in my second year of grad school, she was like, you will not stay in this position forever. Mm -hmm. And give you absolutely every single opportunity that any other senior leader at this school district has to learn, grow and develop. Mm -hmm. Um, but more important than that, you cannot stay in this role forever because you are bigger than being a research assistant, right? Because it would have been easy, like staying in the school district and in the office of the chief of staff. Um, and so I could have built a career there, but she's like, this is not your forever. This is your now. Um, and so like Janice would have me in like trainings with our like deputy superintendents. And I was getting like, I'm like 22 years old, right? Because I graduated from undergrad at 21, started this Mm -hmm. job. 22. So I'm like in my early 20s, um, sitting in um, PMO conversations, right? <laughs> Fantastic, yeah. <laughs> For a school district. Mm-hmm. Really thinking about like how we created the, the project management office for Atlanta Public Schools. Um, I wrote our first health policy. So I'm like doing all this like cool stuff um, pretty early in my career, right? Like and having experiences that like there are people that are like twice my age at the time were having, but mm-hmm. again, like on the strength of like I had like a mentor um that was like just deeply committed to me like so much so mm-hmm. even when I graduated from Georgia State she hosted my graduation party at her home mm-hmm. so like my mother and her are like in love with each other because my mom is like the fact that you just cared for my child in a way that you care for your own child was phenomenal and I think the other lesson that Janice taught me is that sometimes your your sponsors and your advocates are not always going to look like you so the other piece right. to know about Janice is Janice is a white woman mm. um, from the South, right? But like she grew, grew up in the school district and she was like, her biggest mentors were black women, right? And so like, <laughs> it's like this, this this beautiful kind of like tapestry of like, no matter what your background is, where you came from, like the significance and importance of pouring into someone mm-hmm. and each other. And so, and to this day, I actually talked to Janice yesterday. Like she has been without me throughout my entire career. Um, and um, it's funny because I decided I want a second master's in sociology, um, left working for Janice for a little while, and she's about to retire. And I was like, okay, like, I know you quit, but I need you to come back and, you know, finish out for my mm-hmm. I went right back, right? Because that's the, mm-hmm. the goal of um, respect I have for her, but just the commitment that she had to me that I, I just, not that I felt obligated to, mm-hmm. but knew that I had to return. And so, right. um, I left, um, I left Atlanta Public Schools, went and worked for Teach for America. The funny story is I actually had gotten into the Corps 
um, in 2003, didn't go to the core because of I got into grad school and my mother, again, um, I don't know what you know about Jamaicans, but Jamaican mothers are very clear, like your education is first, right? <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I mean, she's like, Teach for America will come back to you. Mm-hmm. 2007, Teach for America reached out to me about a job on staff. So I, I went and worked for Teach for America for a while um, and just really missed the, the ability to actually be a part of the strategic decision making of a district. Mm-hmm. A teacher from America moved to Nashville, Tennessee, which is a whole other story, not for this. Uh, <laughs> but again, just like continuing, like everything happens for a reason. I was supposed to move to Memphis. The contract with them fell through, so they moved me to Nashville um, and had like my first like opportunity to really be thinking about like a comprehensive strategy for hiring teachers for some of the lowest performing schools in the district for Metro mm-hmm. Nashville schools, three of which were lowest performing in the state. Right, and again. Like, I'm 26, 27 years old telling principals, like, how they should be thinking about being the chief human resource officer for their school buildings, right? Mm -hmm. These really unique opportunities to, like, hone my own leadership chops, but also, like, really, like, like, just having, like, this, when I look at it from, like, an existential perspective, I'm like, someone will look at you and where you come from and your background and be like, how did you get here? Mm -hmm. And... I was in a mindset that I'm supposed to be here, right? So that also kind of undergirds my story. Like every single place and experience I've had um, is a belief and understanding that I was meant to be in that place. Mm -hmm. Happens for a reason. So fast forwarding, um, 2015, I was with a a smaller education nonprofit um, because one of my other vice presidents brought me over to help build out the talent acquisition team for that company. It was a high growth, um, small ed tech company. And um, I put in a year's notice. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, there's nowhere to really grow. I, I really want to, um, I, I really want to continue to think about what is possible for me and what's next. Um, and we had an offsite. During the offsite, our new leader kind of, yeah, I just didn't think we were going to mesh. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I had this, like, it was July 22nd. And I know that date because I was like, I think I could leave before a year is over. And no mm. lie, that same day, I missed a call from a 650 number, and it was Google. Mm. Okay. Um, so a sorcerer from Google had called me. And I was like, God, this is really funny, because I literally decided today that <laughs> <laughs> here for a year. And, like, Google called me. Um, and I was like, who knew that Google calls? Mm-hmm. Um, and so the long story short of that is I began in Google and um, – December of 2015, leading one of the non-technical diversity sourcing teams. So Mm -hmm. folks that are not in talent acquisition, it's it's essentially a recruiting team that does passive sourcing through sites like LinkedIn. Right. Um, And then that has begun my almost five-year journey through tech. Um, And again, it's kind of like, well, people are like, well, how did you end up in tech? And I was like, I don't think I ended up in tech. I think like the way that the universe and God or whatever DHT you believe in and my experiences conspired was I was supposed to be here and everything right. um, has happened for an absolute reason. Um, just like in that same way, um, you know, now I've moved on to another large tech company after being at Google for four and a half years. And I'm like, you know, um, all of the experiences and opportunities I also didn't get, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> How to like create um, this, this opportunity for me to continue to be in this space and to be leading in this space. And so mm-hmm. I think like the, the thing that I would tell anyone is being grateful for your process and trusting mm-hmm. the process, right? Because like what my, what my ask to the universe is, is let me be of purpose. Let me be of service and mm-hmm. let me be in a meaningful way. Mm-hmm. Um, so trusting the process has absolutely led me to do that in what is now the tech space. That's fantastic. And I think, you know, the important thing that I I heard you share is that one community plays an important part because I see that a lot of your opportunities came from these individuals, these advocates, these allies, these um, mentors or sponsors who saw something in you that maybe you didn't see in yourself. Um, And I think one of the important things that I might want to dig in a little bit is, and you shared that, 
in that, you know, I get, you know, in working with so many, you know, women and women of color, um, you know, they'll come to me and say, hey, can you mentor me, sponsor me? And by all means, I want to help everyone, but you can only do so much. But at the end of the day, it's because they're, they're, they're telling me that they want to find somebody that looks like them or, you know, which is totally understandable because I did the same thing. But to be quite honest, similar to you, a lot of my opportunities came from individuals who did not look like me. Okay. So um, that being said, you know, in your career, because you've been successful in your career, how did you gain access to kind of influential leaders and build relationships and get them to advocate for you? Um, what were some of the key things that, you know, um, either habits or hacks or things that you did in order to gain their trust um, in order for them to kind of create those opportunities for you and invest in you the way they did? Uh, uh, Monica, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I think that um, the thing that people should know is, and I know that, you know, it's for the fact that everything is relational, right? Like it's mm -hmm. all about the relationships you have and the relationships you build. Um, and I think more so than anything, um, it's been the fact that I come into spaces authentically and wholly myself. Mm -hmm. um, and then so in owning kind of who I am authentically, it, it removes kind of that, <laughs> this is going to sound bad, um, but it removes kind of the initial imposter syndrome yes. that is the initial barrier to entry for people to build relationships. Because mm -hmm. I come into spaces like, hey, my name is Suzette Yasmin Bopham, and I'm here because I'm going to be a cultural value add mm -hmm. so i am i come kind of with that initial like confidence and like not in like a braggadocious or arrogant way but i'm like i'm supposed to be here mm -hmm. right and i know imposter syndrome especially for women of color is a big thing yes. but having that barrier to entry then makes it a little bit more um my focus becomes more of okay now that you're in this space like what are the rules so one mm -hmm. of my on Google, Suzanne French, who I love to pieces, um, says I'm a rules girl. And so initially for me, it's like understanding like what are the rules of this space I'm in now? Mm -hmm. Hierarchical, right? So do I have to talk to my boss's boss through their permission? Is there like already a skip level plan in place? Like how do I actually build like those relationships? Mm -hmm. And some of it honestly is like just like naturally assessing the landscape and like really understanding like who are the folks that like I think I have an opportunity to learn from mm. and like what are the proper ways to also plug in to those folks right because I even think about um, my experience at Google um, one of like my biggest sponsors and he's also become a mentor is an, an Australian man um, and like we were just the other day um, <laughs> messaging on LinkedIn I was like I miss you I'm, I could not want to email your EA um, <laughs> calendar and he's like you know please do but like it was just this natural thing of like I saw in his leadership and the way that he actually thinks um a gap for me is like being able to think about or at the time a gap for me was like really understanding like how does this staffing world work in this tech space and like how does he as our director think about it and what are his expectations right and like right. being able to go to him with like an analysis of like, this is what I see, here's what I don't understand, could you help me understand, right? And it began to build like a really natural relationship around like, oh, like she understands like um, her own like areas of opportunity for growth and development. And we actually, without like me having to officially ever say you're my mentor, mm -hmm. we developed the relationship, right? But right. I think that rewinding, that comes from really clearly understanding the rules and the dynamics um, and the relationships that you have to have in this space. I also say like, <clears throat> and we can debate it, but like some of it actually comes from like how you show up in the workspace through like your work product, right? right. And so a lot of times like what I actually have strived to do first is like while I'm also building these relationships, being able to demonstrate like maybe not qualifications is not the right thing, but like what my value is, what right. product and right. how I'm able to produce um, and show up in a space and making sure like you're identifying early, like here are the low hanging fruit in terms of like my ability to produce and be able to demonstrate mm -hmm. um, like the core competencies that they're looking for. So like, it's like this mixed bag of like relationships, but then also being able to demonstrate that you um, 
aren't capable and able to do the work that you're there to do. No, that's critical advice because it is important to be able to say, you know, how do you, you've got to deliver, right? You've got to stand up, stand out, you have to deliver and then build these relationships so that they, you know, because it builds trust in them to be able to, at the end of the day, they're putting some skin in the game when they're advocating for you. So you, they've got to know what it is that they are, you know, placing their bet on. So uh, I think that's critical advice. Now, you giving, you know, you have this unique perspective of, <clears throat> being um, a talent acquisition recruiter, sourcer, you name it, of trying to um, identify talent in an industry where, you know, we have a lot of underrepresentation when it comes to ethnic diversity, to gender diversity, to um, you name it, all the dimensions of diversity, right? Uh, because it's a very male, white, cisgender kind of a dominated um, industry. Um, and I know that people are probably itching to kind of hear of like, what does it take to um, land a job at an organization at what these big tech names that you have worked in because you're behind the scenes. Um, share with us maybe some of the, faux pas or the mistakes that um, some of our, you know, family members uh, within the, you know, um, within our, you know, just diverse populations make? What do you, what, what advice would you give them? Um, the first advice I give, and I think that's a great question, right? Because uh, folks will get lost in my LinkedIn mailbox all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, like it's a question I get so often. Um, but I think the first thing I will tell anybody is like, make sure that your LinkedIn has searchable keywords in it. Right. So like large tech companies have entire teams that are focused on passive recruitment. Um, and LinkedIn actually has sizable contracts with large companies to provide them that access to find talent. Mm -hmm. And the thing that we do on LinkedIn is either we have not given our qualifications in such a way that it like um, it evokes someone to want to know more mm -hmm. or um, we're not really making sure that our transferable skills are relatable in a way that it would translate to another space. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, and going back to my story, I was sourced through LinkedIn, but I've always had like a really like cogent, um, cogent, compelling and concise headliner and then within kind of my summary i have the things that i do that would also be like super searchable right so like if someone right. for um uh, someone that had expertise in diversity uh, equity and inclusion i would come up in a search right mm -hmm. because of the terms that i have and i think um the thing the area where i see unfortunately folks fall down the most is not being able to talk about the transferability of their skills right mm -hmm. so if you spent years um doing work um like if you've been a project manager in banking right like what mm -hmm. you need to talk about not so much is that you are a project manager in banking but that you have like strategic thought leadership mm -hmm. that you have to work through um you know uh complex problems like being able to pull out those things because those are the the, the skill sets that tech companies are looking for and a lot mm -hmm. of times um our resumes in particular are wrapped up in words that just don't translate. <laughs> right. And, and I don't want to put onus just on the candidate. Cause I do think there's an opportunity for tech to also think more expansively about what they're looking for. Right. So mm -hmm. it's not that you're looking for a recruiter from McKenzie. You're looking for somebody that can be like a strategic thought leader that can do analysis, like those types of things. So I think mm -hmm. it's a, both sides of the <laughs> both sides of the the interview table need to work on that but definitely mm -hmm. like really building um, a stronger linkedin presence with um searchable key terms is really important i also think um the resume mm -hmm. needs to actually translate so one like um i i think folks and it sounds bad but they have like their mom's resume <laughs> 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 it's a, a job description summary, right? So, like, you know, sharpen pencils, typed on a computer. And I'm like, no, like, your resumes now, in order to be competitive, have to be impact statements. So mm -hmm. they have to be qualified as much as possible, quantifiable data, right? So, like, if it can't just be, like, led a marketing campaign. It should be led, you know, 13 high-stakes marketing campaigns that had to reach to this size audience that ultimately drove to... X outcome. Mm -hmm. um, 
and like most of the times when I'm looking at resumes, there's nothing like, there's nothing numeric to like show like how many people you impacted, but mm-hmm. it also really like sum up the meat. Um, and I know it's from people that are doing amazing work, but it doesn't really sh- sh- like, it's not the protein. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. right. Carbs. Um, and so like just doing a much better job in terms of like ensuring that the resume shows the impact that folks are making. Right. Cause ultimately what tech companies are looking is to bring people in that are going to have impact in their organizations as well. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. And I think that's so important where you said it's more of the, um, you know, the competencies and the skill sets that transfer. So you've got to you've got to talk about those skill sets, not like you said, so niche in a, in a specific industry, but really thinking about how can they be applicable across the board. I think that's fantastic advice. And I think everybody should go to their LinkedIn and <laughs> take a look at that and see what, you know, how they fare um, so that they can, you know, definitely uh, come across, you, you know, the, the computer screen and, you know, get selected and get that call like you did, right? That, that uh, number from, you know, the call from Google. Um, and speaking of, I know that, you know, there have been many of us, right, who get the call from an organization like Google or just one of these blue chip organizations and you answer the call and there's that moment of doubt or that moment where there is that imposter syndrome of, um, I think you have the wrong number, um, <laughs> you know, so how, how did you you know, how do you deal with, you know, because I don't know, like, how you were, but I know that I had a little bit of this imposter syndrome of, you know, and self-limiting beliefs of like, do I belong here? Um, And, you know, how do you, how did you deal with that? And how do you actually coach maybe some of your candidates that you find when they think, you know, I, I don't know if I, you know, I'm truly qualified for this, you know, what is the pep talk you give yourself? What is the pep talk you give them? You know, um, the pep talk I give myself when any opportunity comes up, um, especially larger opportunities, is I like literally channel my mom. <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. And like growing up in my entire life, um, and I even have a pillow downstairs that says it's live your dreams, right? And I think at this point in my life, um, my dreams are like very much God dreams and like beyond anything that my own imagine can could even create or ever mm-hmm. create. Um, but absolutely like I like pause, right? So like in a moment when there's doubt, I pause and I hear my mom's voice. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's absolutely like live your dreams. You can do this. Um, and if like hearing her voice in my head is not enough, I'll call her. Um, <laughs> they're, they're a bigger cheerleader uh-huh. um, in my life <laughs> than my mom, but also my dad. Um, so he uh-huh. reminds I actually was with him in November before he passed and I was interviewing with another organization that I didn't get a job at and it was a blessing because I just wouldn't have been prepared at this time to go to another company given that he transitioned in December. Mm -hmm. I was like, I took my phone screen for Google in my dad's bedroom Um, in Florida (laughs) down there. Um, And so when I was interviewing with this other company, my dad was like, Suzette, you know when it's right. And like your instinct has never been wrong. So just trust yourself. Right. And he's like, don't you remember you took your interview for Google in my bedroom and you were just fine. And I was like, huh. Right. And so it's like, also like kind of <laughs> my dad of like, trust yourself. Right. And so, and again, like just this, like, I would say it's like both of my parents, <laughs> uh-huh. you know, like the image of like the, the devil and the angel, like it's, yeah both angels on my shoulder, like, like you can do this. And so, um, I think it's like just the spirit and the the toughness, toughness and the belief um, that my parents have ingrained in me that I am supposed to be every single place I am, um, and Mm -hmm. channel in those moments when I don't feel it. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, um, Monica, the, my hesitation, if any, about like transitioning to tech and moving was more so about what I have community in California. Mm, Right. that I didn't think that I belonged at the organization and company. It was more of the things around like personal life. I think that suffered um, in my transition where I actually didn't have a relief or release from work because there was just a lack of community. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so like at the point when I was tired um, and I, I, I built an amazing dynamic group of friends at Google, but there was no, no like relief from it. So like we'd be right. a break talking still about work. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so like for me, like where, um, I struggled a lot was like, I don't have a community external from, or that relieves me from like the pressure of work in the Bay area. Mm-hmm. 
That's extremely important. And I think, I think um, sometimes we take for granted the, um, the power of community that one, it can help lift you up from when it comes to, you know, work, prof- you know, just opportunities and work. And I mean, you know, right. And as well as I do, you know, just both having experience in recruiting that 70% of our hires, 70 to 80% of hires usually come from referrals, right? Um, and so a community is really important. But the other aspect of community is, you know, when you are first generation college, first generation corporate, you don't really have, you know, that community at home on the home front that really understands what you're going through in the corporate space. Um, but at the same time, it's a blessing in disguise because you can get be surrounded by that community where you don't have to think about work in those moments, right? Um, so, you know, how did you build that community? How did you build that, you know, because I know you made some really, you know, just a tight network and strong relationships within your, you know, work environment. But how did you find that community externally? It, um, it's kidnapping other people's friends. <laughs> 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 but, like, I, I really do think, right, like, good people um, beget good people. And so, like, as I've, like, kind of developed um, my personal and professional network, it's literally been through, like, building relationships within the context of who, like, my friends know, right? Mm-hmm. I don't want to downplay the significance of the relationships that I built at Google because like mm-hmm. I have like literally, um, and this is no shade to anywhere else I work, but there is no more dynamic, fierce, beautiful, talented, wise, golden, supreme. Like I could put every single like loving adjective on it, um, group of women of color in my life than the women that I met at Google. Mm-hmm. Like literally, I probably don't have any new friends at work because I still am like, on this group chat with them every day, talking, <laughs> <laughs> just as if we're all on hangouts, right? Like, they right. literally, like, our soul food and literally, like, held me up in periods of, like, some of my lowest moments in life, some of my greatest moments in life. Like, you would have thought we were friends forever. Right. So it's, like, this, like, natural forging of, like, you're amazing, you're amazing, we're amazing together at work. But externally, it <laughs> literally has been... Um, either like staying in touch with people that I've met, like becoming friends um, with folks that I've met along the way, Mm -hmm. Uh, joining professional organizations. So I have met some really great folks that I've re-encountered in tech through things like the National Urban League, Um, mentors connecting me to other people. So your mentors know great people. Mm -hmm. Um, And just, I, I think being in a place like New York, like you just have more opportunity to interact and engage with people in informal settings where you just connect. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll tell you another one of my secrets is like some of my like good girlfriends now I've met through Instagram and Twitter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we're like Instagram friends and following each other because we were in tech and have met in person. Mm-hmm. Um, and literally you'd have thought we've known each other our entire lives. So like, I also don't want to underplay the significance that social media has played in like building a really strong network mm-hmm. of um, professional women and professional women of color for me. Do you want to grow your impact as a change agent who ignites transformation in others, but you don't have a proven step-by-step method? Do you want to grow your visibility and influence as a thought leader to inspire others, but you don't know where to begin? The Beyond Barriers High Performance Executive Coach Certification is designed for experienced leaders who want to grow their impact and influence. Join this exclusive community of high achievers, advance your career as a leader, and experience the joy of helping others grow. Go to imbeyondbarriers.com and register for the webinar to learn more. That's fantastic. So shifting gears a little bit, um, you know, you've shared some of your, you know, your habits and things like that. But um, in terms of just something key to your career success, what are some daily habits or rituals that you practice that help you, uh, you know, stay on your A game? Um, The first is I get up every single morning and read the daily word and then I meditate. Mm. I want to start like grounded in spirit Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, and hopefully manifesting a really good day Um, (laughs) (laughs) if possible. Um, So I definitely pray and meditate every day. Um, I think remote work from life, work from home life has produced like an interesting set of challenges just in terms of, um, it puts wear and tear on your body that you haven't 
noticed, right? Because you're like, mm-hmm. oh, I'm just like walking up the hall to my house. I um, mean, I've ended up unfortunately in physical therapy because I've lost strength in my leg. And so I have runner's knee. Mm-hmm. Um, the only time I've been working out since March was in my house. Mm-hmm. Um, what I've also put in now to my daily habit is like I put in headset and walk every day before I start working. So I take a 30 minute walk to Starbucks. Mm-hmm. Um, a mile round trip but it also feels like a grounding thing and something special that I'm doing my, for myself before I start the day mm-hmm. um, and so that's become really important to me um, in terms of like other things that I do for myself in the day um, I give myself blue screen breaks mm. um, I now have my team doing that as well um, because I also think the thing that happens when you work from home is um, you just work <laughs> yes like, no clear endpoint. And so I have in my calendar at least a 30 minute block a day where I'm not on my computer. I'm not on ping. It's like exclusively for me. I can like go lay down across my bed and take a quick nap. Um, but just a practice of because we're looking at our screens much longer and there's not a break because we're not leaving the house. Right. Um, to like really protect that. And it, and just terms of like organization, um, like honoring my calendar. Um, mm-hmm. And so um, I have a very clear start and a very clear end. And I try not to overdo that. Um, and I will say another thing um, that I have implemented for myself and been doing the last year is a weekly therapy session. Mm-hmm. Uh, I cannot talk enough about therapy. I cannot talk enough about having a culturally competent therapist, mm-hmm. um, a black woman. Um, I'm very proud and excited to have a black um, woman as my therapist, but I know that's not everybody's reality, right? But right. it's important to have somebody that can, seek to understand your experience if they're not directly from your background. So those are things that I've done for myself to just really sustain me. Those are fantastic tips. And one final question that we like to ask all of our podcast guests, and especially being in the tech industry, and you and I both know, I mean, research shows that, you know, skills, and as a recruiter, right, skills can become obsolete in as little as 18 months if you're not careful and you're not always staying on top of things. Um, What advice would you give women uh, to kind of accelerate their success in the digital age and stay ahead of the curve um, as, you know, we continuously see this disruption in, uh, in technology? Um, I would say, especially now that a lot of um, conferences that require you to travel are online, it's mm-hmm. in the conference, right? Like the right. investment you can make is an investment in yourself. So, um, if you're in sales, um, there's a Sisters in Sales conference that's coming up um, soon. Um, th- there are just so many um, different conferences and events that are now just a click away, a Zoom away that I'm like, mm-hmm. you know, if you really want to like brush up um, on like a specific skill, do that. If you really want to like learn from someone in <clears throat> your field that you may not have had an opportunity to interact with because you didn't know about them before they were online, right? Right. Uh, Sign up for that session because one, you just never know what information that person is going to impart. Mm-hmm. Um, two, to the point that you made earlier in terms of building your community, you're also expanding your network, mm-hmm. um, especially if it's like a well curated um, event space. And I feel like now people are also trying to make sure that they're embedding networking um, into the online and virtual space. Um, and I also say just like read. And people are like, well, w- well, where should I be reading? I'm like, sometimes the best articles I find, and I don't know if you've had this experience, like at the top of my LinkedIn, they have like the five kind of top topics. Yes. That articles for the day. And I rabbit hole down through that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? mm-hmm. Because um, there are some like great articles on LinkedIn. Those articles are great. And I'm like, it di- doesn't require you to like have like an HBR subscription, right? Because like the information is all kind of there. Mm-hmm. Um, literally leverage like LinkedIn every single day to like kind of guide mm-hmm. and learn. And the other, the, the, the last recommendation um, I'll make, um, cause I can go on and on about this is um, I have a smart home. So if you ha- say, Hey, to, you know, the G word, or if you say, <laughs> <laughs> right. They're listening all the time, but like every single one- room in my house has that. And what I've done is um, I've picked out the news kind of outlets that I want every morning. Mm -hmm. Um, And I get a regular update from, of course, like more things like Reuters and CNN. But I also get um, the top 10 things from Business Insider every day. I listen to TechCrunch every day. And I listen to Cheddar because like those are the things also informing like my understanding of what's happening in the industry. Mm -hmm. Um, Like if I hear on there, oh, like Amazon is doing a huge 
employee push or a, a huge drive to get more employees, like, right, that might guide some of the things that we're bringing into our practices. Right. Making sure that I, like, and that only requires me to say two words or right. four words. I'd say, hey, <laughs> Um, but I get, I'm taking in like some kind of news reference every day for my industry as well. Those are fantastic tips. And I love that. I think, um, there's a couple of those that I'll probably put in play for myself. Um, (laughs) and finally, I know that our listeners are going to be thrilled in wanting to follow you and understand more. And also you yourself have, you know, you're someone who's constantly giving and you recently have created a platform yourself to help amplify the voices of black women in tech and beyond. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's called uh, black tech beauty. Um, But you have a series of events that you have launched. Tell us a little bit about that and how our listeners can get in touch with you, follow you, all of that great stuff. Thank you um, so much. So um, in August, I launched um, Bold uh, Black Women, Bold Conversations through the Black Tech Beauty platform. And essentially what it is meant to do is two things. The first is to just amplify the voice of a black woman in tech that you may not know. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, Really like, designed to one, like give you insight and perspective on their journey to tech, but then also give them the space to impart knowledge, right? Like they are domain experts for their field. So in August, I had Julie Wenna, who's um, of counsel at Airbnb, Mm -hmm. um, more about like civil liberties um, and how the tech industry should be informing uh, and participating and engaging um, in um, the civic arena. And last night, I actually had a conversation with Natasha Ahrens, who is the U.S. multicultural marketing lead at Google, Mm -hmm. um, her transition from music into um, tech, but like how we think about influencer culture and how influencers are driving innovation and how folks could potentially be influencers. So continue to like create a space where folks are not only talking about their story, but then able to impart knowledge back out into the community. Um, And then the second part of the conversation, we actually highlight um, either a black beauty brand or a black woman that is working in the beauty industry, right? So doing this multifaceted approach to like, yes, learn more about tech, but then also like bringing along um, and making kind of the connection point around the thing that I think we all enjoy, which is what I enjoy is talking about like, (laughs) (laughs) like, like people don't think about, but even shea butter um, and like the, the black women that are creating shea butter lines, that is a beauty brand. And so making mm-hmm. kind of that connection point. And so that will be a monthly series um, that we run. Um, the next one will be in October. Um, and so we'll share that date soon. But if you um, click on www.blacktechbeauty.com, um, it's Black Tech Beauty um, on Instagram, um, you'll have access to the most up-to-date information. And then those conversations are also recorded. Um, and so you can um, click on one of the profiles and get the link from the last talks as well. Fantastic. Well, thank you for all of the work that you're doing and amplifying those voices because it's much needed. And you and I both know that visibility creates awareness and awareness is what really ultimately is the great equalizer. So uh, thank you for all that you do. And thank you for your time here uh, with us on the Beyond Barriers podcast. Thank you for all that you do. You are an amazing light. And so thank you for sharing this space with me. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to the Beyond Barriers podcast. There are thousands of podcasts out there, and we are so grateful that you've chosen to listen to ours. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend about it and subscribe to get new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Visit imbeyondbarriers.com where you'll find show notes and links to all resources for each show, including the best way to connect with our guests. See you next episode.